Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the podcast for the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost, which is October 31st, uh, 2021. For those of you who um, preach Reformation texts on this Sunday, there is another podcast available on the website. But for those who do not do Reformation Sunday, this is the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost. The first reading is Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. The semi-continuous Old Testament reading is Ruth 1, 1 through 18. Uh, the psalm is Psalm 119, 1 through 8. The epistle is Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. And the gospel reading is Mark 12, 28 through 34. I'll just note this. I think this is a hard time of the year in year B and also in year C because you get in these final days, final Sundays, final weeks of the church calendar, synoptic stories of Jesus in Jerusalem. And they are these stories of, of, of um, controversy over law, over legal observance. And it's hard to set those into context. Yeah, they seem kind that, of disembodied. Yeah, I mean, his opponents are different. This is leading up to the passion, but we're in the time of year where it feels really far away from Easter. But like you said, Caroline, it's almost like these kind of disembodied legal disputes, if, um, which I guess you could preach them as, but it's, it's hard to do that. And coming up, of course, is the, at the end of the year, we get the, um, the, the more apocalyptic text as well coming up, so. Yeah, and that's uh, so- just worth paying attention to where he is and why he's there and who he's talking with. Yeah, I really um, totally agree. This is very odd. So that we, we skip forward. He's entered Jerusalem. Um, then he's gone to the temple and uh, representatives from, from different groups of Judaism come up and dispute with them. So you've had some Pharisees, you've had some Sadducees. I don't remember, do we get Herodians here? And this is the last one. After all of those, this is the last one. Uh, and this guy, a uh, scribe, he's not assigned to any particular um, uh, flavor uh, within first century Judaism, uh, but he comes up and he asks him, seeing that Jesus had answered all the others so well, he asks the hardest final exam question of all, what's the greatest commandment, mm -hmm. right? This, uh, the reason I say that is- And why? Use Jesus, examples. <laughs> yeah, Jesus, yes, be sure to cite your sources. Jesus gives the obvious answer, right? Uh, the, uh, the Shema, which is the Old Testament text, uh, love the Lord your God. Well, Shema Israel Adonai uh, you and then you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and all your strength, and a second, love your neighbors yourself. Obvious answer, right? Um, oh, you are right, teacher. <laughs> I like that. So then what do, you make of, what do you make of the end of this passage then? Well, I haven't gotten to the end yet. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> I, well, I just uh, wanted to do the easy part so that you guys would then have to do the oh, hard yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's it. Well, you know, the question of, you know, the, you know, the question of, you know, which commandment is the first of all strikes me as uh, the way in which this sermon uh, could be set up in a kind of rhetorical strategy that that for not forces but invites the listeners to answer that question uh, because you know you said Rolf well the obvious answer is the Shema well not true for everybody sitting in our wherever they're sitting in living rooms or pews uh, these days I don't know that that would be their answer and so I I think there is a I think there could be a kind of way to set out your sermon rhetorically to say, well, what, what is the commandment? The first commandment is this, but what is that, what does that mean? And is, would that be your answer or is your answer right now, uh, you know, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor and why? I, I think it just, I think it does invite a, um, our own response in some way not just waiting for Jesus to answer, but to, uh, to say, well, why did he ask this, this question in the first place? Uh, what's at stake here? And, uh, and we know Jesus got the right answer because he's Jesus. So he's always going to get the right answer. Uh, but, 
but how does that make us respond to um, why, why is this the most important commandment and, um, and particularly here and now? So that's my first thought about the first part of the passage, not the last part of the passage. It does provide an opportunity for a preacher to invite people to think, where do you anchor your own theology? I mean, I, I would never phrase the question like that because it would probably terrify too many people in a yeah. congregation, but yeah, you know, yeah. what, what are the foundations? What do you go back to? Not necessarily specific verses, although for some people they might want to do that, but what's, what's at the heart of that? And then to complicate it by talking about all that's there in the law and how do you sort through this and how does your, how does your foundation matter for what you're going to build for what's going to come, come from it, which is maybe worth noting. And then to talk about how extraordinary the Shema is in its, in its context. Here's a place where you definitely would want to preach on more than one text, I would think. If you want to go that route, yeah. Um, I, so, yeah, so I would know. Part, well, part, well, part of what I was trying this. to get at, I'll come back to the point. ending in a minute. <laughs> part of what I was trying to get at, though, is um, just to remind um, preachers, to remind your listeners that um, this was not a new thing with Jesus. The, the uh, this statement, and it would not have been seen. Sometimes I think people might read this in an anti-Jewish way. See the Jew. I mean, they. Uh, they have all these other laws, you know, uh, don't eat pork, all these things, right? And so uh, that some Christians might read this as Jesus, oh, look at Jesus. He has a love ethic versus a follow the law ethic. No, the love ethic is built into the law. And uh, so the Shema is the positive version of the first commandment. The first commandment negative, have no other gods. The positive, that means love God. And then love your neighbors yourself. That's what all the rest of the, the second table of the Ten Commandments are. How do you love your neighbor? Don't kill, steal, commit adultery, bear false witness, and so on. That um, we, share these two, uh, we share these two laws with our Jewish cousins. And um, now leaning into the end of it, so then uh, there's sort of a chiastic thing. Then the scribe says, you're right. These are the two uh, greatest commandments. And then Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom. And after that, no one dared ask him any question. Yeah, but so, Jesus, oh, when Jesus gets the answer right, you don't want to, you know, mess around with that. And then starting, uh, starting next week, um, if you're in uh, you're doing the 24th Sunday, then Jesus, what he, Jesus does next is uh, they didn't dare to ask him any other questions. So then he starts and picks an argument with them. I still got a few more things to say here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, before we get, well, the end I think is important, but before we get there, I think the other thing that is interesting, and again, as you said, Matt, you can't say, well, you know, what is the, what is your, invite people to think about what is the, what is the thing that under, you know, that is Anchors the their theology. Of your theology. Uh, but I, what I think is interesting about this move here is that the scribe doesn't say, just say you are right, but there's an act of paraphrasing. There's an act of, um, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't say the Shema exactly. Uh, he said, he is one and besides them, there is no other to love with all your heart, with understanding, with all the strength. Uh, much, this is much more important. So there's an act of like, yeah, there's an act of paraphrase or the act of restating the command in one's own words, uh, that uh, not to lift up the scribe and say he's all oh, wow, you know, super fantastic, but there, but there's a calling to that as well in terms of a rhetorical response. What is that 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 first commandment? But then, what does it mean for you? Like, what is it? How would you define it in your own words? I mean, you might know the words from the Bible or what preachers have told you, but what does this mean for you to love that 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 the Lord our God, the Lord is one? Okay re-say that in your own words. And that I think is another act that this, or another invitation that this kind of sermon could do. Yeah, the point's not to say, well, I've identified the right verse. Now we can mm -hmm. highlight that one. We can do some needlepoint to put up in the hallway by the church bathroom that has this verse on it, you know, but what is that gonna look like lived out? What's that gonna look like expressed in our worship and our budgeting in our, in our mission and everything? I do think yeah. it's significant. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yep. I, I was then just, I was going to go to the end. Oh, 
I, that's what I was going to do too. You want to go first? Uh, well, you were not far from the kingdom of God. I think, I think the important thing there is that, uh, again, going back to the kingdom of God has come near. So what is it about, you know, what is it about this? What's, what's been displayed in this, this interaction uh, is, it, it indicates the nearness of God going back to um, Mark 1, 14 and 15. So that's it. That's all I've got. I would also say go back to Mark chapter three to, to help think about this or to maybe frame the significance of this dialogue. In Mark three, verse six, the Pharisees and Herodians conspire to kill Jesus. It takes exactly two chapters and six verses before he's um, attracted that much hostility to him. And then later on in chapter three, the scribes from Jerusalem come down and they offer their assessment of Jesus and his ministry and they say he's satanic. Right? He has Beelzebul through the power of, of, of demons that he casts out demons. It doesn't say the scribe is the same guy, but he is a scribe in Jerusalem. He's part of the same kind of upper crust, major league, temple-based scribe culture. And Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom. And that's, to me, that's significant. Um, no way would Matthew's gospel ever say this. And in fact, in Matthew's gospel, that line isn't there. There's not that that, that handshake extended to the scribes in Jerusalem like there is here in Mark. So we've had people that, that understood who Jesus was that we wouldn't have expected, like Bartimaeus, uh, like the Syrophoenician woman, like others throughout the story. And here now you've got a scribal elite who finds common ground with Jesus. And there's the, a, a sense of hope or connection, which I think is significant before we paint Jesus as utterly anti-establishment or utterly anti-Jerusalem. And um, we want to be really careful about using those kind of collective labels and say, here's an individual, an individual scribe who spots something in Jesus, who has productive dialogue with Jesus and is described as being at least close to the kingdom. So that's, I think it's one more mark and reminder to be on the lookout for people that you didn't expect to have insight because they might teach you more about your tradition than you understand yourself. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful. Thanks. Of course, Deuteronomy six, uh, one through nine is paired with Mark because well, that's where it is. So that was my observation for the week. Well, the, uh, so the big thing to note that, it, that your uh, listeners might want to know about is why does uh, the Mark inversion say, the Lord is one, but here, if, you, uh, if you're following some modern translations, when you look at the Deuteronomy, it says, uh, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Um, and and uh, so the, the traditional translation is, uh, here, Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. That's the traditional translation. Uh, and that is also what you get in the Septuagint. And of course, the, that that's what... Um, Since Mark is written in Greek, they follow that translation. Uh, the Hebrew is it's multivalent. It's ambiguous. It could be um, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one or the Lord alone. Or um, I can't remember the third option there, but uh, the, uh, those are kind of the, the two versions. Um, and so just pointed out in case someone asks why they're different. Is number one baby a possibility? Is that the other one you were thinking of? The Lord's number one. Number one, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. The Lord's okay. the greatest. Uh, no, I can't remember. Okay. I, I um, you know, I, I'll admit I saw this text and I'm like, oh yeah, Shema, of course, you know, and didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. The commentary by Adora um, Mumbaya Swango is helpful to me where she talks about in verse five, like what's the response to, to the oneness of God or to the supremacy of God? The response is love which is a, a really kind of basic observation. I'm like, well, I like that. But then she also describes it as an extravagant love that involves one's conscience, one's essence, and one's vitality. Mm -hmm. And she describes that again, that has to do with being oriented toward morally right decision-making, a community with ethical values, and a community full of energy for life, uh, or one of vitality. I thought that was just a really nice summary uh, or an interpretation, maybe, as a better way of putting it, of what do we mean when we say 
heart, soul, and might or heart, soul, and strength. Yeah, I like What that does that too. look like communally? Mm -hmm. For an, in, in Israel's case, for a nation or for a community that pursues those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I also think the elements of recite them to your children, talk about them when you're at home in a way, which is everywhere, when you lie down and when your eyes, that's every time. Bind them as a sign on your hand or an emblem on your forehead. And, and uh, if you have a Bible study or even maybe in worship, you can show them how this, what, what that actually looks like in Judaism um, for the uh, extremely observant traditions. Uh, but yeah, that this is a community where we're teaching the, uh, the next people in the, the next generation uh, this ethic of love. Which is an identity marker. Right for the king, for um, for communities that that uh, know that the kingdom of God has come near. Nice, uh, Ruth, semi-continuous. But this is one of two. Uh, certainly not enough um, uh, in the book of Ruth. But uh, and I, uh, <clears throat> I really appreciated uh, the commentary of uh, and you know she. There's all kinds of uh, of contributions we have to uh, this this particular past this particular book, but uh, the role of Naomi uh, and I, I I I wrote a, I preached a sermon on Naomi. This was ooh wow, it's been eight years ago now, and it was we but we had but might be helpful for uh, preachers to know that Word and World had a whole volume on Ruth, wasn't that right? Isn't that it's on Yes, we did. Word and World, yeah. our, our seminary journal. And part of that, by the mm -hmm. way, is five of us. Um, yeah, we preached a five. Took over the chapel for a week and preached yeah. uh, five days in a row. Uh, you could do that. Um, you could look ahead for those who are not doing Reformation this week. You know, you could do Ruth one, then next week in place of all saints, if you want Ruth two, and then look ahead skip first Samuel one and then skip, you know, yeah, get all the, uh, mm -hmm. but, but it does get you. Yeah. So you just, you know, you could take between now and the start of Advent and preach through Ruth. Um, but for those who are not doing that, but want to preach through Ruth, uh, chapter one is this, uh, it's worth, uh, bringing on because it's such a story because it's about Ruth and Naomi. It's this incredible, by the way, that was the spring issue of uh, 2013 says our elf and minion uh, to us in the chat. I um, also just Googled it. If you just type word and world Ruth, it was the second thing that came up. Yeah. So easy to find the sermon series. Yeah. And it, it's sermon, you can never escape your old sermons. You two. I'm very no, proud of that word. Evidently. My sermon was called on being Naomi. So. And yeah. I got to preach on the threshing room floor scene. Um, no one else wanted it. And I did. So uh, that's the fun scene. But this is, so, this is such an important uh, story that, that uh, the whole book is a long narrative that shows what Hesed is. And in this story, uh, Naomi and Ruth show Hesed, which is extravagant, uh, extravagant commitment and love towards each other that Ruth is willing to follow Naomi back to her people. And in the so doing, she becomes a um, peopleless sojourner, uh, there, uh, which is what you didn't want to be in the ancient world in a kinship-based society. You did not want to be away from your kinship system, but out of loyalty and love for her mother-in-law, she does this. Um, so, and this is the, uh, Boaz later says, oh, this, the next act of your Hesed is even better than the first one. Well, this is the first one. And it's it's extravagant and beautiful. The, I'd say it's out of I, loyalty and oops, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I'd say it's it's out of <clears throat> certainly it's out of loyalty and love. It's also out of this, I think, a will to survive. And so also to to point out this is a story of well, of two women who are migrants, refugees, uh, very much at risk in different places, kind of forging a new sense of family for the sake of their own mutual survival and and what that looks like. And, and one of the, maybe one of the outcomes here is that's just as much of a family or just as likely to be experienced by divine blessing as any other kind of form of, of family. And so to help people 
um, see the, the the strength of human will that's also operating throughout this book. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, just to call people's attention to the commentary again, and uh, and to think about preaching. Yes, Ruth is it's it, it's a relationship between these two women and the dynamics involved, uh, and yet Ruth uh, Naomi is a kind of character. As the commentary says, Naomi's story is one that meets people where they are in between grief and joy. And I was really struck by how Naomi might might be our might be a really good biblical biblical companion in this time of um, the the where we are in the pandemic. Psalm one nineteen, not all of it. Take heart. Yeah, this is here as a response to the Deuteronomy reason, uh, excuse me, the Deuteronomy reading. And um, it's uh, a passage about just loving the law of the Lord. And I just would point people to Mark Thronfite's commentary on the website. And we've got Hebrews 9, 11 through 14, number five in Hebrews of seven, I believe. Is that right? Yes. Yep, so five of seven. Thoughts? Well, so much of Hebrews is how much more. That's, you know, one of the <laughs> ways to summarize. Maybe that's this. what we're asking. Is that what you're saying I'm asking? How many how more? more? There's different ways. Two more, two more. more Sundays. No, how much more? If this, then how much more if, if Jesus is involved in this? And, you know, whenever a, whenever a, passage starts with a word like but or moreover or furthermore or something like that or therefore you have to look back but and it is talking about sanctuaries it's talking about tabernacles and so I think you just have to kind of pull people into almost the idealism of the book of Hebrews idealism in the sense of you know an ideal priest giving an ideal sacrifice in an ideal temple there's it, it's the, the the legal stuff can you know in terms of talking about sacrifice can be i think really distracting but it's it's mostly a, a book that's just an a, attempting to extol jesus <laughs> and his supremacy and his how much moreness and so it's the kind of thing that maybe is less about explaining this i mean you want if you want you could take this passage deep into the whole sacrificial system and you will find a lot of questions there as well as some answers. <laughs> or you can talk about the way in which this book is trying to extol Jesus, because finally that's where it's going to take us. Because the point of all of this is to get people to continue on in faith, right? To be persistent, to be, to have um, um, stamina in their own faithfulness. And so it's still holding up Jesus as this person, as this ideal to follow. So, I mean, I almost hate to say this. There's some liturgical things you could do around this text or how you follow up your sermon or how you might intersperse praise uh, with this is uh, always up to the preacher's discretion. <laughs>